Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before I get to our guest here, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Ariel Glissendorf. She's coming to us all the way from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. She's a nationally qualified bikini competitor. But most importantly, she's our current guest. Why don't you give us a little bit of a backstory on what inspired and what motivated you to get in shape and adapt this healthy and fit lifestyle? So I've always been an athlete. I played basketball and volleyball and track and field in high school. And then I did a semester track and field in college before I got hurt. And I spent a year off kind of not doing anything competitive. And I met a neighbor who did bodybuilding. And it was the first time I've heard of the sport. So I started researching into it, the dieting and the lifting, and decided that I wanted to give it a try since I love being competitive. So I started in 2014, and I've been doing it ever since because I enjoy it and I love what it does. That's so awesome, and I always love to ask because, I mean, especially when you first get started in the in the gym, I always say, you know, if you're to walk into a gym with 100 people, there's 100 different ways as to how those people got into shape, whether it comes down to, I mean, their diet, their nutrition, how many reps they do, what exercises they do. So many little things add up to the overall package that you end up seeing. And I always were to say, you know, if you were to walk up to someone and say, you know, what did you train for this body part? It looks amazing. What works best for them 99% of the time isn't going to work as good for you. What was that experience like for you sort of figuring out what worked best for your body? Um, right away for the first like two years, I kind of did it by myself and it somewhat like worked because we did in through like high school and college, the like lifting weights all together, but it wasn't really for building your body. It was just random stuff all thrown together. And so then finally when I got um, a coach to help me, it kind of helped build up like, oh, I know how to do this now and I know what this workout is for and kind of just like not doing the same workouts that everyone else does because I know now that certain things for them isn't going to work for my body structure. Yeah, I always like to compare it to, I mean, you're kind of just like a mad scientist where it's just so much trial and error where you're just concocting your own potion basically to figure out what works best for your body type. But that also leads me into my next question. I mean, everyone's genetics are differently. So when someone walks into the gym, I mean, everyone always has that one body part that really, really takes off where they don't have to, you know, work on it as much. And then everyone also has that one body part that, I mean, they just have to train to overdrive just to get to catch up to everything else to make it look like they even work it out in the first place. I mean, I'll give you my examples first. So, I mean, my back, I had jobs all throughout college where, you know, I was working in warehouses where, you know, lifting and loading, you know, heavy boxes into trucks. You either got a really nice back or you quit. Those were the two options that were presented to you. But also, I mean, I'm six foot three, so I mean, my lower body is just absolutely shot where, I mean, I have to train it into overdrive just to get it to look like any semblance like I work it at all. I mean, I still have friends in the gym when I walk in who say the joke, you know, hey, Ryan, you plan on working legs at all this year? And then I got, eh, you know, I, may, I always respond, yeah, maybe, who knows. But uh, what were those body parts for you when you were getting started? Uh, for me, the one that was easily able to build was like my quads. Um, I'm six foot tall. I was always a jumper. And so that's the quickest thing that was always able to build for me. And so I have to like not do quad based lifts now. <laughs> and I would say the hardest one was my shoulders because I would always activate my traps into it first. And so it took me several years to finally be like, oh, wait, now I'm actually using my shoulder and not the traps. Okay, I honestly didn't even know that she was six foot tall, everyone, until just now. So, like, she's our third <laughs> guest that we've had at six foot tall. So, I love that because now we can have our own little, like, tall person segment where we can talk about how crappy it is for tall people to work out as opposed to some of these shorter people that come on. I hate it because some of these people, they're, like, super, super in shape. But then I'm like, how tall are you? And they're like, oh, I'm 5'3", five, 5'2", five, or whatever. And I'm like, okay, come on. It's like, for what, if I could be one day for that height, because let's be honest, being tall has its, especially for a guy, has its, has really great perks. But like, it's for one day, if I could go to the gym and be like five foot two, just, and just be what that's like. I mean, because the, the muscle is so much easier to, to build when you're that short because you're not, you're not, I mean, just, I could go into a whole long tangent with that. But it should have given it away when you said you played volleyball. I was going to ask then, I was going to be like, oh, how tall are you then if you're playing volleyball? But so we got another six footer on, so I'm glad. To have that. So that, that does lead me into the question then that, I mean, I asked for my, my tall people. What have been some ways that you have found that you have helped adjust to the fact that, I mean, when you are that tall, it's going to be very hard for you to, you know, sort of put on the same type of muscle and have the same type of growth that as, like I was telling you before, like someone who's like five foot two has, 
have there been some tips and tricks that you found out that really helped for your body to really help it catch up for the fact that, I mean, you are going to have to put in a little bit more work? Um, I would say honestly, finding like the variation and a lift that can actually like hit that muscle for you. I've had a lot of people tell me, you know, like, oh, if you squat, you hit your glutes and your hamstrings. But for me being so tall, if I do the same kind of squat, all I'm hitting is my quads. And so I will like tweak it and move it. So it doesn't even look like a squat form, but it's hitting everything I need to. And so I tell people all the time, like, just because you're six foot and somebody's like five, four, it's not going to look the same because it's not going to hit the same. Thank you so much for saying, yeah, for me, squats too, the same thing. I mean, it's like, everyone's like, oh, it works everything. I was like, not for me. It doesn't. For me, I can feel the burn in one area and that's it. Everything else, everything else just goes absolutely static. The worst is, um, I, well, I would say I honestly, the worst is trying to do anything that has to deal with chest or back just because it's just so much of the motion when you go down, you're just using so much. I think you get a little bit more activation in that, but it's just, yeah, those type of workouts. I mean, I can, I mean, I, I could go into a whole spiel about that, but how long into your journey before you decided that you wanted to give bodybuilding a shot? I mean, I know you said you had that one neighbor who sort of introduced you into it, but how long training before you decided to do your first show? Um, I think I trained all of 2013 and then I had done some research into like possible shows around the area and there of course wasn't any in South Dakota at the time. But there was a couple in Minnesota, and so then March of 2014, I like did my first one, and then spent three months off, did another one. So I was like, "Yeah, I need to slow it down and take a break to like build." Which one did you do in Minnesota? Oh, I, uh, I think Gopher State was my first one. Was that the one in Bloomington? Yes, I think so. That's my hometown. That's my that's my hometown, everyone. So that's that's where I'm that's where I'm filming this right now. And I think I think they did it at my high school too. Was it? I think it was at like Jefferson High. Yeah, that that's. It was. That's my that's my alma mater. Yep. Small world, everyone. Yep, that's what that's where they have it. That no, I remember even growing up. Like I hear sometimes there's like, oh, there's like a Bible show. I never went to one there, but I was like, at my high school, I was like, why would they do it on the middle? But yep, everyone's small world. So yeah, your first bodybuilding show was at my high, my alma mater high school, and it was around. So it, it was like 2013. You said 2014. Okay, I was gonna say 2013 was the year I graduated. So that'd be a little too weird then <laughs> if if that would be if that would be. So yeah. Yeah, that's that's actually that's really awesome. I was gonna say I have had a few guests on that have competed at that show too, and I just find that so fascinating. I was like, oh yep, yep, they they had bodybuilding shows at my at my high school, but yeah, that that's so awesome. But I always were to say, you know, for the general public, I mean, ninety five percent of the general public would not be able to get into the shape required to just go on a prep because I mean, just to be able to go on a prep, you have to be in such a great amount of shape. But then going on a prep, I mean, you are notching things up to an extreme where I mean, your diet has to be perfect, your training has to be perfect. I mean. Everything just becomes so scientific. What was that adjustment like for you going from, I mean, probably a healthy and fit lifestyle that you enjoyed before that, but now to this just where everything is just so down pat and so scientific? I would say right away, um, it kind of like hit me hard. And so I was definitely like craving all the food that I used to eat. And it came as like a shock being like, oh, like portion sizes are a thing. Weighing out your food is a thing. But now that I've done it for like so long, when I show like what I eat to people, they're in shock by like right now, like how little it is because I'm two weeks out from a show. And so I'm like, but it's normal. <laughs> like I'm used to this. I could I could tell that you're two weeks out just because the, the face. I can always tell when the when the comparisons are coming out. It's starting to shrink. And I was like, okay, I want that face just for like one day. But like I, I'm still I'm still trying to put on my summer body, even though I know it's August. Everyone, shut up. I know I've been trying my butt off to try and get it. But um, what what show are you getting ready for? The North Americans out in Pittsburgh. Ooh, yeah. I've I love Pittsburgh. I've been there a couple of times. It's 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 a nice place, but yeah, we wish you nothing but the best of luck in that. But what would you say is probably the biggest nutritional change that you've had to make over all of your preps? 
Oh, um, I would say kind of like playing around and figuring out what foods actually work for me. Um, I went from like a cookie cutter diet from one coach who just had me eating the same thing every single day where it wasn't even food I enjoyed, where I just sit there and like have to scarf it down because I was told to eat it. Or now I'm with a coach who lets me enjoy the food and I don't have to eat these gross things that I don't want to eat. Oh, yeah. So so have you just started with If It Fits Your Macros or has it been something that you've been doing for a while? It's something I've been doing for three years now. Yeah, that's one thing that a lot of people that I've talked to have followed. I mean, a lot of people just have different variants of it or, I mean, they just may follow different, you know, different uh, – plans but I always say you know just to look it up and you know it is something that a lot of people do swear by so I mean I, I, I could I recommend it for people that are interested in that but I always say you know just before people even get ready for these shows a lot of the times people don't realize you know what it's going to entail and what it's going to take you know just to be able to get on that stage like we were talking about you know before with the prep and what that's like but as much as the physical adjustment is is like the mental adjustment is even tougher for so many people. What is that like mentally for you just to sort of get that mental shift where, I mean, like we were talking about earlier, you, I mean, everything has to be so down pat. But also the mental aspect, you're going to be battling yourself some days when it comes to, you know, getting up and wanting to do this work because you might be just so tired. You might not have gotten enough sleep. What is that adjustment like sort of just to develop that mental toughness where you're like, OK, no matter what, I do have to do this. Uh, it does take a lot of work. I do tell like first time competitors, if you don't fully like love yourself, this not is, isn't a sport for you because it's so toxic in the mental state because there are so many, especially women who go in and then have body dysmorphia afterwards. Luckily, I was one who I enjoyed what I looked like before I started and it just continued. And even if it's off season, I still enjoy the body that I have. Um, I do have days during prep where like I'll break down crying in the middle of cardio because I'm like, I can't do this anymore. This You'll be that one person crying during their cardio and everyone just looks at you and they're like, okay, so prep. She's on a prep. Everyone called. I've, I've seen that a few times at my gym where it's been guys or girls, you know, they just break down like in the middle. And I was like, okay, they're in prep. Everyone like I even one person was like going to go up and talk to him. And I was like, okay, they're on prep. Let them be. Let them be. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. You cry it out and then you're like, I'm good. Yep. I got this. Yep. I can do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that I love to ask that question because it is so much more, I think, a mental battle than it is a physical, as much as the physical battle is, but that mental aspect, I mean, that is just such a huge obstacle. But I also love to ask because I had the number one sleep specialist on the planet come on and talk, and first of all, he called all the way from Oxford in the UK, and he had one of those accents where, I mean, you just felt like you gained 10 IQ points just from talking to him. I was just like, okay, you're going to talk the entire time and I'm just going to listen. But we were talking about the importance of sleep and one of the biggest things when it comes to recovery, well, probably the biggest thing actually is sleep. I mean, if you get the proper amount of sleep, I always say after like a hard day's work or a hard workout, you feel like a superhero basically the next morning than if you get the right that right amount of sleep. But when you're doing bodybuilding, a lot of times – Getting the proper amount of sleep is not in the cards, especially when you're in your prep. I mean, for especially when you're really leaned down probably like you are in the last two weeks, your body's just going to want to be sleeping a lot, And but it's going to be hard to fall asleep when you're that leaned down. What are some tips and tricks that you like to recommend for people who are trying bodybuilding or who have, you know, maybe been doing it for a while on how to get that proper amount of sleep or at least to be able to, you know, because let's be honest, if I wake up from like four hours of sleep, there's no way I'm getting a workout in. I'm just one of those people where I have to get my beauty sleep. Oh, yeah. Um, I do have trouble sleeping a lot because I do work like a stressful job. And so what I found for me is doing like some stretching and yoga and then like light reading right before bed. And I do everything that's going to like wind my body and my mind down because the sooner you're just like calm, the sooner your body is going to take it and fall right asleep. What I used to do in college is I would get up and especially if I pulled like almost an all nighter and I knew I still had to get a workout in or whatever, I, I just do the old, you know, fill up a bucket of water with ice and then, you know, just dunk my head in it like right before I left. And, you know, I, I'd be fine. That usually kept me awake for about 45 minutes, which is about, you know, enough for the workout. So, you know, that was that was a little tip and trick, everyone out there, you know, the, I mean, you're not going to. That's really going to wake you up, let's be honest. So, you know, I, I, I was good from then. And then, you know, five-hour energy, energy can go a long ways every once in a while, especially now that I work night shifts. So that really, really helps me out. But one of the things that I was most surprised by when it comes to bodybuilding that I was just so shocked by that affects so many of the compares that we have on, and I would have never guessed it in a million years, 
is posing. I mean, for so many of my guests, posing is the hardest part of it. It's harder than the nutrition. It's harder than the working out. I sort of like to make the comparison now where you can be a great driver. You can never be a perfect driver. You can be a great poser. You can never be a perfect poser. It's always ever evolving. What has your experience with posing been like? Um, so when I first started, I kind of like watched YouTube videos and tried to do like the same things they did. I didn't take any into consideration, anything of like how it looks on me, but now it is kind of a thing where it's like, you need to be practicing every day. You need to breathe, like practice your breathing, holding the poses. Cause you honestly can't just like walk up there, especially in heels and expect it to look good. Cause you're nervous and you're just like all in your head and out there and half the time like you're going to forget what you're doing if you don't have this down. How tall are you in those heels? Uh, six, three, six, four. Good God. Yeah, that's that's going to be that's 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 one thing I was thinking because actually my second ever health and fitness guest, she was the tallest ever bodybuilder. She was six, three without the heels, just like me. And then she's like, yeah, I'm like six, seven on those in those heels. And I was like, OK, that's not even. But also like when you were talking about, yeah, like when you first look up those those videos of people posing, it's like, yeah, when you're taller, it's going to be a little, little bit different posing. How do you think because of your height, you ha- you've had to change up your posing as opposed to someone who might see be a little bit shorter? Um. I've definitely like switched it up. So it's now a, um, how my body looks good to it. I don't try to like do the same thing as everybody else. Um, but a lot of times it does, especially for comparisons, look funny if I'm, you know, like six, four compared to a girl that's only like five, six in heels. Cause then it's like our bodies aren't the same comparison. So this isn't a great comparison shot. <laughs> No, yeah, I've always found though, especially with the taller people though, it's for me at least, it, it can be, it seems a little bit more easier to sort of give out more of a gracefulness just because you have a little bit more to work with where you can just kind of make it flow a little bit more as opposed to someone if they're like five feet tall coming out there, it's kind of, you know, hard to, you know, make it a little bit seem a little bit more graceful. But another part about the posing, especially for bikini though, is that you basically have to find your own sass, basically your own sort of attitude. What has that experience been like? Because for some people, I mean, that I've had on they just don't have that personality wise where they sort of had to have to have invented that. Is that something that you had to invent or just, did you just naturally just sort of have that, you know, that sass and that attitude that comes required with a uh, bikini pose? I honestly have terrible stage fright. And so right before we're going on with all the music going, I'm like having my own little dance party. And so I'm like, just not even stiff going on stage where I'm like, I'm just going to have fun. If I fall, like I'm just going to kick my shoe up. Cause I'm be like, Hey, this was part of posing. <laughs> Have you ever fallen? I have not. <laughs> Fingers crossed, everyone. I don't want to bring that moto on there. Knock on wood. But, yeah, I, I I always love to hear if anyone's had those stories. But another part about the posing that I love to talk about is what is your favorite pose and what is your least favorite pose? Ooh, honestly, part of posing would be for Bikini we getting to do our own thing. I don't like the whole for most of the other um, competitors where it's like a front back and you have to do the same thing. I like it being kind of like your own thing and almost like a a huge dance party up there for you. Yeah, I would, I would prefer that as well. Yeah. I I always said if I, if, and if we lived in like an upside down world where I had to become a bikini competitor, I mean, I would say the back pose just out of the mandatory poses would be my favorite only because that's I could put my face down. I wouldn't have to smile. You know, I could I could let the smile down a little bit. I could breathe a little bit because, I mean, we had one guest from Australia come on a couple of months ago, and she talked about how she was told that she could have won the show. She ended up getting second, but she had let her smile down for about twenty seconds during the like the open posing when um she was waiting for other people were when she was waiting for other people to pose. So that is one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize too is that smiling aspect. I mean, your your jaw muscles. They're probably going to be the most sore out of anything. But I always say, too, especially with these posing sessions that the the competitors do, a lot of times you're even more sore after the posing sessions than you are during your workouts. And a lot of times we hear, you know, after the shows, I mean, you're more sore than you've ever been. So that's just another huge adjustment that I think a lot of people don't realize. But now we go to the... As you can tell, I'm one of the palest people you'll ever meet in your entire life. I have my thick Norwegian skin. I mean, I got to put on SPF of 1 million out there. I mean, look, you can even look at the camera, how my face is like, it's cut off like halfway right here with the sun's. It's basically like, it's like Twilight, except it's not like the sexy vampire like Twilight. It's more of like when they open the arc in Indiana Jones and everyone's face melts. That's basically me if I have a shirt off and I don't have, and it's during the summertime just because, I mean, I could look, I mean, I could have an eight pack. I could be, you know, just like the most shredded person ever, but just how pale I am, it is, it is shocking. Like if we had part albino, some line in family history back then, I mean, I would totally understand. So I've never been tan a day in my life. 
well, why do people just get to get tan? We hear so many stories about how, you know, you see muscles pop out. You see muscles that you never knew that you had. What is that experience and what does that look like for you? And what's that feel like when you get that tan on and you see like all that hard work really come to fruition? Um, yeah, I definitely enjoy the tan because I'm a, um, a ginger, so I'm super white too. I hate going outside because I'll become a lobster. And so like half the time I don't even see anything until I get the tan. And so I enjoy that part, but it's always been one of those crazy things when I first started, I was like, oh my God, there's so many like naked people beside me. Like, what am I supposed to do? And then now it's like, okay, this is all natural. Yeah, I'm one of those people where they would have to put, you know, at least 10 coats on. I mean, it would just have to be coat after coat after coat. But yeah, I was going to say with the whole naked with the whole naked part, I did not believe the first person that told me that. So I was like, okay, there's no way that's true. They're, they're making that up. And then after about the fifth guest was talking about that, I was like, okay, I don't know why they hit it. But I was like, I, I, I guess that's a thing. But we saw that you, so you're not naturally blonde. I thought just looking at your hair that you'd be naturally, or did you just add that on? I, I, so I was born a dark red like this, but then it lightened up so it's strawberry blonde. So that's what like you see here because I'm waiting right before show. So you are AK one of the luckiest people of all time that was born like a pure ginger and then you were able to sort of shed part of the gingerness. I get to make a ginger joke, everyone, because my best friend's a ginger. I always say that. So I get to make, I, I have the ginger jokes, you know, basically just, you know, coming, coming right out of me just because I'm so used to telling them all the time, but no, Connor, I love you, everyone knows that, you know, you're, you're a good friend, but I like to make ginger jokes, but anyway, so, um, yeah, I mean, just another thing with all that tan that a lot of people don't realize is that, I mean, you can't sit on anything, you can't really stand up against anything, I mean, going to the bathroom, that's a whole conundrum in and of itself, but I mean, just, you just have to become like a statue, and that just adds on to the checklist that I love to, you know, I love to say is made, basically, when it comes to these competitors of just how much they have to go through when it comes to being on stage. But now going on stage, I always say, you know, this is a question that I ask for all my guests, whether they be, you know, my bands or my fitness competitors. For my bands, I always like to ask, you know, when you get to go on stage and perform live in front of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, what is that feeling like? But that also applies to the bodybuilders that I have on the show. What is that feeling like for you when you get to step on stage and show off all that hard work that you've worked months upon months on? It feels amazing. I think that's my favorite part of it is being able to go up there and just show what I've worked so hard for. And it's just a, an adrenaline rush to know everyone's just like watching you and you're in that spotlight. Even if it's for the 10 seconds you're on stage, like it makes everything worth it. Now, when you're like you said, you, sometimes you might not be on there for such a long period of time, but does time really seem to fly by or does it seem to stand still when you're on stage? It, it varies. Like when you're going through your posing, it seems like it's going super, super fast. But then if you have a ton of competitors and you're standing on that sideline already done with your posing and waiting for everyone else, then it's like, okay, are we almost at the end yet? <laughs> We had one woman on who was, it was her first time doing a physique show, and her last name was Abernathy. So literally, she was on stage for, I think, an hour and 15 minutes because everyone else, because her first name was Abernathy, it started with an A, so she was the first to go, and then she had to wait for everyone else, and you know she had to be posing that entire time, which, I mean, good luck with that because the human body is not designed to be in that pose for that extended period of time. Now, you're a G, so you're a little bit in the middle, so, I mean, you get a little bit of leeway with that, but, yeah, it's still, it's just absolutely ridiculous but now we go to a fun question what is your go-to post show meal oh um my last one was a just massive burger and i'm still trying to like debate what i want in pittsburgh we're gonna go out and eat some cookies and donuts for sure but i don't know if i want pizza or a burger just yet this is the first time that i've heard of it was my last podcast that i did yesterday slutty brownies now i can't stop thinking about them <laughs> I'd never heard about them before. Now, believe in my and all my twenty five years on this planet, I've never heard about slutty brownies until last yesterday. But now I've been looking them up, and I was like, okay, I got to order some of these or do something because yeah, they're they're all that I think of. But I'd always say, if I ever compete, I would just rent out a Five Guys for a night and just be like, here's the thing, you know, I'm gonna pay you until I either you know pass out, die, or throw up. But either way, you know, I'm getting my money's worth. But probably one of the most important questions that I love to ask all of the guests on the podcast because. I mean, so many people have that myth where that look that you guys put on stage is a sustainable look, they think, just because they see all these photos where people who have that look and they think that, you know, oh, just because, you know, they've worked that hard for that look, they're able to keep that. I think it's partially due to shows like Biggest Loser, where, I mean, people go on this show and they lose 150 pounds and some of them are able to keep that weight off. So people think that, you know, when it comes to bodybuilding and getting lean, 
you can maintain that look and achieve that look, you know, for a long term. Now, granted, some people try to maintain that look and usually it shortens their careers and it's not healthy for you to be at, you know, that lean stage look all the time. But what has that experience been like for you? Because I know you said like you were happy with your body before you started competing and, you know, so it's a lot easier for you in the postseason, but it's still for a lot of people, it still can be very hard for them to just realize that, you know, like, hey, this look that I'm putting on stage, I'm not going to be able to keep that. What has that been like for you and how has that evolved as your career has progressed? So for me, um, I definitely am able to put on the weight at, like fast afterwards. And so I'm like used to just being lean for like one day and then it being gone. Um, I think it's just one of those things where you have to realize that it's honestly not healthy to be that lean, especially for a female, because it's going to mess with all your hormones. And it's not a uh, obtainable look to have year rounds. You need to put on more body fat to build from you can't stay lean and build muscle at the same time i always say it's sort of like starting your own business where you got to spend money to make money you got to put on weight if you want to put on muscle i mean that, that's just really one of the best ways to describe it and it's like you want eat more just eat a little bit i mean you get to you get to eat i mean let's be honest i mean who doesn't who doesn't enjoy that but now another stereotype that I love to bust on this podcast, and we talked about this briefly before we started recording, it's gotten better the last five years due to Instagram, but there are still so many women that have that fear where if they walk into the gym and they pick up, you know, one one machine or they pick up one weight, they're, you know, just going to put on 50 pounds of muscle overnight. And I always say to that, you know, sign me up. I'd, I'd sign up for whatever you're doing. I mean, just to spend five minutes talking to you, I would spend, you know, just an irresponsible amount of money, but did you have that fear when you were getting started? And obviously, if you didn't, I mean, you probably hear that all the time now still. How do you like to respond to that? Um, so funny thing about that, I had actually heard that from my dad right before I saw, started college track because he wanted me lifting in the summer. And he was like, you lifting a weight is not going to make you manly. And then now kind of like reversed into it. I'm lifting weights all the time. <laughs> but I do still hear that from women and it it shocks me and it irritates me. And I look at them and I'm like, I look nothing like a man. Like it helps me look more like a female than anything. Yep. And then, well then, well then, and then I always say like some of the guys that call them out, it's like, yeah, well you don't even look like a guy for, you don't even look like a man basically. And you don't. So yeah, it's just, it's just, it's yeah. It's, I always find that so funny that it's, I mean, it's like, yeah, people don't realize, and that just shows a little bit of the ignorance too, where people just don't realize the amount of hard work and the amount of training that you have to do, even to look the way that you look right now. I mean, it's just, I, yeah, I, I, I don't understand that at all, but I always love to tell the story about when I was in college and getting bigger and stronger. One of my really good friends, she came up to me and she said, you know, Ryan, I see that you're, you know, making all these changes. I want to go to the gym, but I'm just afraid that I'm going to get too bulky. And I told her, look, the amount of weight that you carry in your purse when we go out to clubs or when we go out to get something to eat. I mean, she had a really heavy purse. Now, I don't know if she had like a dead sorority sister in there or something like that who like made her angry one night, but it, it was a good like 20 to 25 pound purse. And I told her, I was like, lugging that thing around 24-7, you are not getting an ounce of muscle. And that sort of convinced her where, I mean, that really, really helped her out. But that also leads me into, I mean, the one thing that I think affects women so much more positively than it does guys is the confidence boost that working out gives you. I mean, we've heard so many stories about, you know, some life-changing decisions that some of our female guests have made when they've, you know, started working out. But how have you taken that confidence boost and used that to affect other aspects of your life? Because I always say that is the one thing that you can take from the gym and use it to affect everything else in your life. Um, it does. I typically use the gym a lot for um, just like the stress relief. Uh, like I've said before, like I work a very like stressful job with um, behavioral kids because I'm a counselor. And so then I have that added like mental stress on my plate while in prep. And so honestly, half the time I go to the gym just to like decompress. How, how are you even, cause let's be honest, if I ever had to deal with that, I mean, I would go crazy after like, a, without even being on a prep and then being on a prep, I mean, more props to you. I mean, good God, I can't just even thinking about that is getting me stressed out right now. It's like, how are you able to deal with that? But that is just, that, that is just so awesome. And yeah, I always say if you could have a job where you're helping out other people, I mean, there's nothing more fulfilling than that. So definitely, I mean, if anyone can think about that, do that. But yeah, just that confidence boost is just so important. But two of the questions that I love to ask every single health and fitness guest that I've had on, for the first one, I mean, there were so many positive things for me when I started working out and, you know, getting bigger and stronger. But one of the negatives is that you're going to get asked to move a lot of people's furniture. You're going to get asked to open a lot of pickle jars or, you know, bottled water or anything that's screwed on tightly. 
and I'm still home with my parents for the next couple of months before I move out, and every single time they come in with groceries, I basically have to lift the car into the driveway and carry in the groceries, being the good son that I am. Has that been a similar experience with you where people just assume that you can do favors for them, especially when you're in this prep look where you're at now where, ironically, you're at your weaker, you're not as strong as you are during your during your off season, but you still get asked a lot to do those favors? Um, honestly, I don't get asked a lot of stuff about that, but I do get a lot of like people just being like, oh, Ariel's so big, Ariel's so tough, she's like bigger than a man. <laughs> and so I'll hear stuff like that all the time where I'm like, really? No. Well, you do get the best of both worlds then where you can have that look and you don't get asked to do stuff about it because I, well, the, well, the only reason I ask, you know, normally there's bikini competitors on, I don't ask them because they don't have like the muscle that, you know, like the, the physique competitors have where you're like, okay, yeah, they're going to get asked to help out with other, with other people's stuff. But because you're six foot tall and I always say, you know, being six foot three, I could have zero muscle at all and it would still be, oh yeah, tall guy, come and help us. Tall guy, come and do that. Especially in the grocery, whenever I'm shopping for groceries and there's always, there's always that one old guy or old lady like, oh, tall guy, can you help me get, reach that? thing up there and grab that it's like yeah okay I'll, I'll help you out with that but yeah I know I yeah I used to say like I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit less in shape than I was in college just because you know I do this 40 hour week job and then I do this podcast and you know I still work out you know like two to three times a week I'm 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 on vacation next week from work so I'm gonna you know work out five times next week that's my goal but I always said when I was in a lot more shape in college and I'd go to bars you know anytime I was sleeveless you get asked to arm wrestle all the time or there'd be drunk girls that would come up and feel my arms without me asking but you know I was so vain back then you know I'd pump it up for him a couple of times you know just to just you know just for the just for the laughs but uh yeah that's definitely one thing that I did to deal with but now probably my favorite question to ask and it's a multi-million dollar idea I always say for any anyone out there who's thinking about making some money but when it comes to clothes for fit women fit guys have their own problems but fit women I always say you know if you have big broad shoulders dresses aren't your best friend jeans are another thing that we hear of all the time where if you have a big lower body and a small waist jeans are not made for that what have been some ways that you have found that you're able to compensate for the fact that your clothing options can be limited and for the fact that I mean you basically have to have two wardrobes your prep wardrobe and your off-season wardrobe um definitely I like steer clear of jeans at all times especially being tall too I'm never gonna find a pair that are long and fit um so leggings are my best friend because they stretch so for off season and on season and um like winter I just live in baggy sweatshirts and summertime I'm in a tank top so I don't have to have sleeves Can I just say the best part about living in the Midwest, and especially the upper Midwest, since she's from South Dakota, I'm from Minnesota, is the fact that we have about a six to seven month period where it's acceptable to wear a sweater and just to be able to cover up. So, I mean, yeah, that is the best. I mean, yeah, the amount of times that I that I've saved, you know, from, you know, revealing this pale skin to everyone just because, you know, I'm walking, I'm rocking a sweater and some, you know, sweatpants. Yeah, that's 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 ridiculous. But when it comes also, I mean, especially working in a school, there is a certain attire that you wear. Do you just rock or do you just rock the leggings when you're working in the school? I'm able to wear comfortable clothing since it's more of like a residential area. So it's like a home based place. And so then I'm able to wear like running shorts or my leggings and I'll wear just like a t-shirt or a sweatshirt too. Cause they want to make it so you're safe at the same time. I, I was going to say like, if yeah, if I, at my school, if we saw teachers wear leggings, well, that would be a shock for, you know, shock of the century if we had it at my school that we had. So, but yeah, that's awesome that you are able to sort of wear what, what you want and wear more comfortable things because yeah, especially we've had, we had one person where she was like a CEO of a corporate company. And I was like, good God, like having to find like a wardrobe for like that. It's like, ugh, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I always said, you know, I had two fashion guys on the podcast, and I told them, I said, you know, like, hey, I have all these guests, you know, all these bodybuilders and all these other, you know, rock bands. Make some clothes for them, and they haven't gotten on it yet, but I got to tell them, you know, get on it because it is a gold mine waiting to happen. But now we go to our questionnaire part of the podcast where I'm going to ask Ariel here about a half dozen or so health and fitness questions that we ask all of our guests and see how our answers stack up to everyone else we've had on the show. So for our first question, what is one item that you always need to have on your fridge? Uh, I would say my two gallons of water. Like I thrive on that and I always need it. And so it's easy to just grab the gallon and go. I, uh, that's for me. I, so I work a job. I'm at UPS where I, I, I'm a supervisor, but I still sometimes have to get in the trailers and help people load or still help, you know, with the production. So literally uh, this last Monday, I worked a 14 hour shift just because I doubled and I, and I had at least three gallons of water during that, just because doing, doing all that. And let's, and I couldn't even fall asleep when I got home because of all that water had to go out some way. So, you know, it's, you know, that's another weird, hard thing about bodybuilding is people don't realize, I mean, you're, you're going to need to be going to the bathroom a lot, especially when you're in prep, just because when you chug that much 
much water, but yeah, water, yeah, it's a very underrated thing, I think, when it comes to bodybuilding that most people don't realize, you know, drinking so much water is almost necessary. I, I said for me, you know, chicken and eggs are probably the two most popular answers that we've had. But now out of all of your followers that you have on Instagram, what would be one thing that you think they'd be most surprised by if they met you in person? Oh, um, honestly, I think it would be learning what my job is. A lot of people ask me if I'm a trainer or a coach. And so then when I tell them like, no, I'm actually in the field of psychology and social work, they're like, what? I've never known that. Yeah, that would be one thing that I would definitely say was shocking to other or, or the height too. But I mean, obviously, that's one thing that I, that I get all the time just because I'm sitting down for this entire podcast. But now if someone were to walk up to you and say, you know, Ariel, we made the decision where you can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. What would be one thing that you'd like to see changed? I think uh, across the board, the consistency between every single show, um, it's become more like opinionated based in the judging. So half the time when I'm watching shows, I'll pick somebody out and be like, oh, I think they'll win. And then like far off won't make it where I'm like, okay, I don't know how this one won, but then they don't win the next show, but they look better. So it's more of like opinion bases. That's 100% what I feel too. And I mean, yeah. And for anyone out there who, you know, needs a little bit more on that, I mean, it's like for some of these guests or if some of these shows that they have, I mean, some of the judges might want a little bit more of a leaner look, but I always say if you're going to do like a show one weekend and then do a show the next weekend, the, that next pair of judges might want, you know, a little bit more of a muscular look, a little bit more fuller of a look. So it's really hard for these competitors to sort of realize, you know, especially what shows to do and also to realize, you know, what they need to look like coming into the show because it's like good luck putting on that, you know, muscularity and that fullerness in a full week, you know, even if you were to win that more of that leaner show. So yeah, just to have a little bit more parody where, I mean, like all around people just say like, Hey, this is the look that we want to see. I mean, that would be so much more helpful too, as well, I think. But now if you were able to go back in time and talk to the 18 year old version of yourself, what would be the best piece of advice you would give her? Um, I would tell her just not to give up, um, not to listen to anybody has to say back then, back then I was like bullied in high school. And so then I was like, Oh, I'm never going to make it anything big. I'm just gonna be like, just not enjoying life. And so like seeing where I'm at compared to everyone else that bullied me, I'm like, well, I'm making it because I've never given up. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And I always said, you know, first of all, I would go back in time and I would tell myself, you know, invest a little bit in Amazon, invest a little bit in Google. You know, you can never do wrong with that. But more than that, yeah, just to tell myself, you know, like, hey, you know, it, it, and I would honestly say, too, I mean, it's like your plans most likely are never going to work. I mean, if you may make plans, but stuff is going to change. So just go with the flow and just realize that, you know, there's probably one person out of 100 whose plan worked out exactly perfectly for them. Everyone's plan is always ever evolving and ever shifting. So just go with that and just realize, I mean, what path you think you might have when you're 18 more than likely is not going to be the path that you're going to be on, you know, seven years later in my case when you're 25. But yeah, so and I, I would have I would have told myself to start this podcast earlier. Don't wait until you're basically 23 years old to start it. But yeah, so I couldn't. I couldn't stress that more for any of our younger viewers out there listening. But now if we were to talk to you a year from today, what would be some goals that you would have liked to have achieved when it comes to your bodybuilding, when it just comes to your own like personal life? What are some goals that you would have liked to have achieved if we were to talk to you a year from today? Um, place pretty high at a national show. Um, that's like my go-to because down the road I do want to make it pro for like Olympia and the Arnolds. Um, and outside of that, I would say finally get my um, degree in psychology because I've been in and out of school for years. And so I can become um, a children's counselor. Yep. Uh, so what so what really interested you in psychology? Was that always something that you wanted to do or was that something as you got older, you just realized, hey, this seems like something that I'd be interested in? Uh, it was never something I thought I would like. We had a psychology in class in high school, but it was like taught by our band teacher and she just made everyone carry like a weighted doll around so it's like that's not anything I like but then I took a psychology course in college and I really enjoyed it and my older sister is um a counselor for kids and she used to work at my facility for about like six seven years now and so she would tell me stories about it before I started and I was like I think I would actually like that and here I am yeah that's so awesome I took a psychology class in college and I thought that it was interesting but yeah I have a friend who's doing that too and he really enjoys that but now you brought it up a little bit so what is your family's opinion of you you know becoming a bodybuilder and doing this what has their reaction been like um 
they my family's kind of like more reserved about it um my sister's take on it right away was like well are you just doing this for attention type of thing um my mom used to like make fun of how little the bikinis were and just be like well I can give you a piece of string and that's what you're wearing anyways um (laughs) But now they like they've gone and seen a show and they've seen how much I enjoy it and that I've not given up yet. And so after every show, my mom's always like, well, what did you learn? What did you take away? What are you going to do differently next time? And so they're all for it. So your mom's one of those parents, basically. I believe me, my mom is the same exact way where it's like, so what did we learn from that? How are we going to do it differently? And I'm just like, do I have to basically write you like a whole review? Basically, do I have to turn in the is the paper due next Friday, mom, where I can kind of give you like a whole. That's what I always like to respond to that by. But. But yeah, so no, when you, when I heard you say that, I was like, okay, that is so totally my mom true, my mom too. So I was like, so there is another person out there like that then, or there's another parent out there like that. Yeah. I finally found one after all these years, but yeah, that that's so awesome. But now lastly, I always love to ask, you know, if someone were, to, if you were walking down the street and someone were to come up to you and say, you know, like, wow, you look amazing. I want to get into shape like that. What is the best piece of advice that you like to try to tell people just to get started in their fitness journey? Because for me personally, I found that for so many people just to get started, that is the hardest thing where I always compare it to, I mean, I'm a very OCD person myself. So, I mean, if I am, you know, if it's like 701 and I plan to work out at seven, got to wait until it's like 715 or 705 or it's got to be more of a round number. So I try to come up with like every excuse in the book or like, if I really want to work out on a Sunday, but I haven't, I'll be like, Oh, I'll just wait until Monday because that's the start of a week. So I can get like a whole thing done. So I try to come up with every excuse in the book, but I have found that, I mean, once you walk into the gym, it is nearly impossible to walk out of one without getting a workout. in. so is there any advice that you like to give people or first timers just so that they're able to stick with it and really just, uh, help them get started in this lifestyle? Um, honestly, I, a lot of times will tell them that you're not going to see changes within a week. And it's going to be the hardest those first two weeks. And I tell them, like, that was the hardest for me was finally getting into, like, the groove of it. But after two weeks, it does become a habit, and things are going to start changing after that. I always said that, too. I mean, I always said – and another big thing, too, is that, like, sometimes these people, they might try to, like, go and work out for, like, three hours the first day because they feel like, oh, I'm just going to do everything. And then they wake up the next morning, and they can't even get out of bed. And it's like, yeah, well, you kind of did that. And also, go with a friend, too, because that can really help, too, especially with the motivation where, I mean, if you're going by yourself – you got to be a really motivated person when you're starting out to be able to see those changes. But you know, I mean, if you have a friend, you know, to kind of, you know, talk you a little, talk you into things a little bit more and, you know, kind of, you know, just sort of help you with that. It could be just so amazing. But now lastly, is there anyone that you would like to give a shout out to before we wrap things up? Oh goodness. Um, I'd say probably just like my family members since they've always been there for me. Uh, my coach, Adam Atkinson for See You Later Leaner. And then honestly, my bikini company, um, Angel Competition Bikinis, because they have made my suits ever since 2014 and they do an awesome job about it. Again, I'll give a shout out to all those people down below. And again, we wish you nothing but the best in your show coming up in Pittsburgh. And everyone, go and give Ariel a follow. I'll leave a link to her Instagram page down below. I highly, highly recommend it. And again, we cannot thank you enough for coming on the podcast. I mean, it was so great. I'll I'll end it sort of with a little, I mean, one of the reasons why I love having, especially, you know, the female bodybuilders come on is because, So many people don't realize, you know, just the hard work and the dedication that goes into the sport. But a lot of times, like you said, if you're walking down the street and people be like, oh, you look, you're so big, you look like a man or whatever. People don't realize that, I mean, just that, like I was talking about, the hard work that goes into it and the fact that I always say, you know, people don't realize that you're just a normal person, basically. You just have a hell of a lot more dedication than they do when it comes to the working out and the training and the nutrition. But you're just an average normal person, which is why I like having guests come on and share their stories for people to just realize, like, hey, they're just like me, except, you know, they may work out in the gym a little bit more and they have, you know, a hell of a lot more dedication than I have. So, again, we cannot thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing your story. And, again, we wish you nothing but the best of luck. Thank you. Absolutely. So, again, you guys, Ariel, It was great having you on, and this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the Spot, signing out. Have a great day, everyone.